Hey, girly girls. How's it going? It's me, CJ, trying to make a return to the tube so I'm not just a book club discussion channel anymore. Do you remember me? How's it going? Sorry for being dramatic. It's only been like a month since I uploaded a video, but <laughs> I don't know. I used to be a weekly kind of girl, so it's a new, new cadence for us to get used to. So I want to do a few things in this video. One, give you an update on my reading year. Two, answer some questions I called for in a Q&A to ease myself back into a video recording because I feel a little shy. Three, give you an update on our house renovation because I don't know I've talked a lot about our house renovation on YouTube in the past and that is what is going on in the most major way in my life. And four, I guess give a Sunny's update. So yeah, buckle up baby. <laughs> I think this is the worst reading quarter of my life. Yeah, I feel comfortable saying that. Um, <laughs> very scattered. I'm not happy with really anything I've read so far this year, and I desperately need someone to recommend me a CJ novel that is going to be an absolute 10 out of 10 for me because I can't find it. I don't know where it is. My uh, taste barometer is off. I can't pick up or seem to tell what is going to please me nowadays, but... A couple of standouts so far, I guess, from this year is Martyr by Kaveh Akbar. I really loved this novel. It's dealing with grief, identity, diaspora, addiction, alcoholism, what it means to make art, what it means to have an impact. It's written by a poet and I think it is worth all of the hype it's getting. It wasn't a perfect book for me, but I enjoyed its playfulness with form. It has multiple narrators and flashes between time periods and I think the thing that really worked for me and was the most successful was its depiction of addiction and loving someone with an addiction and recovering addicts and how those thought processes and behaviors are still ingrained even if they're in recovery. Um, I loved it. I think that's the one standout novel I've read so far. Couple disappointments, Like Love by Maggie Nelson. We know I'm a Maggie Nelson head, but unfortunately this was feeling cash grabby to me. It was um, a collection of previously published essays and conversations. And I realized I don't like reading conversation transcripts, which is a good thing for me to take forward in my reading life. Um, but this was just not good for me. Opinions by Roxane Gay. I have liked Roxane Gay in the past, and used to read her, I think I've re I read her when I was like much younger and Bad Feminist was maybe one of the earlier pieces of feminism exploration I read when I was in college. Um, but this again is her roundup collection of previously published newspaper articles and a lot of them are for the New York Times. And my takeaway was like, wow, it's super centrist of you. <laughs> Um, a lot of centrist opinions and kind of um, not what I needed to read in this current political climate, if that makes sense at all. One other shout out from this list is I read State of Paradise by Laura Vandenberg. I really liked this book. I think I want to reread it actually because the end kind of twists and turns in a really interesting way and I want to experience it again because I was kind of rushing through it reading on my Kindle. I found that that's the downfall with Kindle reading is the immediacy of tabbing forward for some reason makes me rush some of my reading. I don't know if anyone can relate to that, but this is a book set in Florida. I love a Florida book. I'm from Florida. We know this. We're over you talking about it, CJ. But it's set during the pandemic and her town that the narrator is living in becomes technologically dependent on a VR device and people start disappearing. It is spooky, it is unsettling, and I think it's just overall like a great depiction of the uncanniness of Florida and escapism in a COVID context, but not in a world that's one-to-one -one with what our world was. Yeah, I've read four, eight, 12, I've read seven, 17 books so far this year and none of them have been great. <laughs> Um, I am in the midst of reading a couple things right now, The Hundred Year War on Palestine for an abolitionist book club I'm a part of. And then I'm also reading Dead in Long Beach, California by Vanita Blackburn, which is the Sunny's pick. And I'm not loving it. <laughs> um, 
we just discussed Beauty Land for Sunnies two days ago and it reminded me of what a special book that was. And that book is dealing with a lot of themes that are grief driven and also sci-fi adjacent as well, which I think Dead in Long Beach is also doing, but in a very different way. I'm going to keep going because some people in the Sunnies Discord have said they've loved it and they liked reading the book, but I don't know. I need a good novel. I need a good novel. I might pick up Great Expectations by, oh, what was that author's name? It's not near me. I can't see it, but the one out by um, Hogarth because, I don't know, it seems like novel-y, seems plotty. <laughs> Maybe that's what I need. I need a, a plot. Um been reading a lot of non-plotty books so far this year. Maybe that'll in, in a, invigorate me. But if you have any CJ-esque recommendations, I'd love to hear them. Do you like audiobooks and are there any standouts in your mind? I'm a new mom and audiobooks are kind of my only reading option right now. Wah. I am useless for you here, queen. I do not like audiobooks. I have tried. It is not for lack of trying. I've tried different genres, different narrators, narrators that are the author who are reading their own work. It does not work for me. There's something about the different mode of receiving the information audibly that my mind just cannot focus on and can't retain. I think a reason why I love reading so much and reading physically is it it forces me to focus. Like I cannot be thinking about something else while I am reading a book. It's just not possible for me. And that is so rare in my compartmentalized and fragmented attention span. So if I know audio works for so many people out there and it's the complete opposite reading experience of what I just described. And if that's you, I'm super happy for you. But you're never going to get audiobook recommendations from me. If anyone has any audiobook recommendations for Kate, please leave them in the comments because I want you to keep reading as a new mom. <laughs> Indie Elise 1995 asked, besides thrifting, what are your favorite clothing brands at the moment? That's a good question. I am liking Damson Matter who I think are a Dutch brand. They did these really cute cheetah print cargo pants that I actually bought and then returned because they didn't look good on me and I was so upset about it. I, th something about the cut of the pants just like was not working with my body shape, but all of that to say, I still really like what they're doing. Um, a lot of fabric mixing. They do a lot of um, Ganny-esque ripoffs that are more like high street takedowns, I would say. Um, a lot of the like Ganny vest and like the ties and um, like pops of neon with more denim -y or cheetah print base layers. I like what they're doing right now. I also really like Thrills, the Australian clothing company. That's where I get all of my shorts from. Um, I live in Arizona, so I wear shorts like six months out of the year, which is very new for me coming from Portland, but um, I needed to up my shorts game and they have been helping me a lot. What else do I like? I shop at Madewell occasionally. That's probably the big like store you can go to at the mall that I shop out the most. And then sometimes I like some stuff on Lisa Says Ga. The sub brand that they carry there called Find Me Now. I really like that brand. They have some fun like see-through tops and play with like material and ribbing in an interesting way um and then I also like the shop bop app if you haven't used that before it's like a good retail app who carry a lot of mid-range designer brand stuff but also stuff like Levi's and they have two-day shipping and um a good return policy and then I also like Levi's I buy some stuff at Levi's and all of that to say all of those brands I just mentioned I always try to find them on Poshmark first because <laughs> I'm cheap um I think that's the big ones that I hit there I just love your vlogs they got me through COVID what is your favorite book of all time thank you I look back at my channel and I'm like I can't believe I vlogged like my family's Thanksgiving <laughs> I was a crazy girl back then. We were we were all lonely for community, weren't they? Weren't we? Um, what is my favorite book of all time? <laughs> I immediately like break down and start looking at the floor. What is my favorite book of all time? Um, impossible question. 
Impossible question. I used to say, I feel like I used to say Vanishing Twin by Leah Dietrich when people asked me this question. And then sometimes I said The Deeper the Water, The Uglier Fit the Fish by Katia Apikina. And then other times I said um, The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. I don't know, a mixture of those. I feel like if you asked me right now, it's Beauty Land by Marie Helene Bertino. I think that's my favorite book of all time. It's very special, but it changes all the time. And I think that's good and healthy. Book exchange slash sale going. I think you meant, I think you mean the bookstore, but if you mean, yeah, I think you mean the bookstore. The bookstore is going great. <laughs> um, I am loving it. I'm super fearful for the upcoming months because unlike other, booksellers I know and other retail places. I Summer is absolutely the slow period in Arizona because it's like 110, 120 degrees outside and no one wants to shop or be alive and all of our tourism leaves. So we'll see how we slow down, but it's been steady. I feel like I'm really in a rhythm with it, really investing into the bookstore space, understanding our buyers, not buyers, our um, customers a little bit more and just in a good swing of things or I'm not like overwhelmed by getting programming and you know setting the store up and it's more just like maintenance now which feels a, like a really good place to be in. There's four upvotes so multiple people wanted to ask us. What has it been like to move to a more progressive city like Portland back to your hometown which is very conservative as an adult? Do you feel like people are open to having conversations or does it feel pretty divided? I think progressive is a funny term, um, especially as it relates to Portland, Oregon. I have a lot of thoughts about this question. I think Portland's aura and veneer of progressiveness is fake. <laughs> I think it is um, a lot for show and I think a lot of it is not actually woven into the city's fabric and how people take care of each other and the community there um and that is of course has exceptions and there are people there who have more leftist or progressive ideologies but as a whole i think progressiveness and like white liberalness which portland um embodies a hundred percent is a veneer and doesn't actually have tactical change that the community and those who need it feel. That being said, I feel like progressive culture does grant some luxuries that I am missing in Yuma. And I think how I would identify those is as art support or independent org support. Like for an example, a really concrete example of this is Portland had a really big and thriving independent art scene. And that is everything from independent movie theaters, independent bookstores, independent galleries, independent arts organizations, small presses. And I think that really has an effect on culture in arts communities in ways that are like very visible and not visible. Um, Yuma has none of that. We don't have a music venue anymore. Our only independent music venue closed a couple of months ago, which is like devastating. I feel like for local bands here, I am the only local independent bookstore. We don't have any independent movie theaters who are showing like weird experimental art indie films. Um, so that has felt bad because I feel like those artistic driven entry points to culture are where a lot of progressiveness and leftist liberal ideas can be planted in a way that is separate from, I guess, governmental or civic dogma if that makes sense. Does anything I just said make sense? So that has been the worst part. The part that has been really good and I'm trying to get better at articulating is because Yuma is so much smaller, your impact of showing up places and making your voice heard and 
collaborating with different organizations and aid groups is it feels a lot more personal because the scale is so radically different. It also literally matters more because there are fewer people. So the physicality of your body being there, like means something optically. So my involvement in progressive organizations, demonstrations, protest in Yuma have felt 10x to me better, more meaningful, more impactful than anything I did in Portland. And I think that's also because all of the ones that I've joined in Yuma so far are own voices led. By just the fact that Yuma is majority Hispanic and Latinx, our border aid movements are led by own voices organizers. Our Palestinian movements here and um, aid groups are led by Palestinian voices, which has been very cool, etc. And I feel like that is not the case in Portland. And maybe I was in the wrong ones, but the demographic divide of being around own voices, organizers, and community organizers has felt way different. That's a ramble. I feel like your second part of your question was, do you feel like people are open to having conversations or does it feel pretty divided? I would say it feels, it feels pretty divided. Yuma's a really weird place for a border town. We're a huge military town. This is a giant marine base here. So Yuma's entire social fabric and governmental fabric is in bed with the military. And also um, it's a huge snowbird town. So in the winter, our population doubles because winter visitors who are all almost all senior citizens come down to Yuma for access to border health care and also for warmer weather. And to make a uh, sweeping judgment of the senior citizens based on who my literal neighbors are, they are all right wing Republicans. Like my direct neighbor has a Joe and the Ho have got to go flag in our yard that I have to see every day. So I feel like people, conservatives feel like they have more space to be openly hostile in their messaging of their beliefs here. I see a lot of crazy ass bumper stickers about gun rights and the Second Amendment and um, keeping our borders safe and closed. Like the, the most vile, exclusive messaging that you can imagine being on a moving vehicle. I feel like a lot of people here feel like it's safe to be able to express those because there are so many signifiers out in the community that they're not alone. Like the tr the number of Trump flags in my neighborhood is fucking crazy. Like it would shock you. It would shock the general public. But I feel like it's so important and like literally my life's work to open a space like Sunny's that is resistant, openly resistant to all of that hateful dogma and offering people a chance to have access to queer women-led leftist ideology um, <laughs> in a space like Yuma. My TLDR of that is I have lost some personal comforts of culture access that I really valued and was used to in Portland, but I have gained an incredibly deep sense of purpose of being here, finding like-minded people and making the place that I grew up and that raised me better than I found it and better than it could be because of all of the garbage 
political views that I think other people have here. <laughs> That's my very honest answer. What are some books that shaped you as a reader? I mentioned some of them earlier about my favorite book question, but Vanishing, Vanishing Twins by Leah Dietrich. I don't know if I would have had the language or comfortability or framework of identifying as queer if I had not read that book. Number two, The Deeper the Water, The Uglier Fish by Katya Apikina. That book is so vile and weird and sad and <laughs> uncomfortable. It really offered me a look at literary fiction that was darker and I seem to have been drawn to more and more. Number three, The Seas by Samantha Hunt. I feel like as a reader, even in my very early years, I gravitated towards magical realism and I would identify the seas as being magical realism, but with a gorgeous literary coming of age, like heart stabbing twist. I think about that book all the time and it is very water sign coded in my opinion. How do you make time for reading considering how busy you are and that you work two jobs? I have let go of any metric of wanting to read a lot in quotations, whatever that means for you, but I read like an hour before bed every night and that's what I do. Sometimes I'll get really sucked into a book and read a little bit more. Sometimes I'll pick it up on the weekend, but I don't like read for hours and hours every day. I read for an, an hour every day at night before I go to bed. And how do I do that? I have done that my entire life. So I can't imagine habitually going to sleep without reading first. It's so ingrained in like the thing I do to wind myself down. But tactically, some advice I would give you is keep your phone out of your room and don't sleep with a TV in your room. That's some stuff I do. So I'm like, all right, I'm here in my bed alone. I'm gonna pick up a book. What are your best tips for finding and vetting contractors slash folks you work with on reno work? What do you look for or what are some red flags? What would you say to that? I would say unless you absolutely trust the like source you're getting it from, only work with people that are involved with an actual company. Yeah. Okay. So basically our recommendation is don't hire like a handyman person who says they can do a thing. Unless, unless you, someone you trust, unless someone you trust has told you that they did something and you have proof of it looking good and being structurally sound and it has longevity. We basically found recommendations through my mom who recommended her electrician and then the electrician recommended us a plumber and we love both of those people but we did strike out on some recommendations that they recommended. So like our electrician recommended us some guy who could fix our roof the roof was not fixed. We had to redo the roof. Um, but I will also say we had to hire some people that we didn't get recommendations for, like a window person. And the window person had good reviews on Google, like looked like a normal company. You know what I mean? Like no red flags. But then he installed two windows in our house and the framing of them is wrong. And there's like structural cracking of where the windows are lacking support. So you really don't know. And I would just ask a bunch of questions. And if they have like client testimonies, maybe, maybe they have someone, someone's work you can drive by and go see how it looks. It kind of is hit or miss because we've been happy with our, like some of our scrappier people who aren't necessarily associated in billing through the company they're working for and then we've been incredibly disappointed by some people who like are bonded insured and have LLCs and the whole kit and caboodle so it is a uh, a guessing game it is a trust game and uh good luck it's really hard <laughs> last two questions what are the best and worst things about running a bookstore the best thing is it is the best thing in the world <laughs> It is literally my dream come true. I love being in there. I love like having a physical manifestation of a space that I've like genuinely poured hours and hours and hours and hours of myself into. And it like looks the way I want it to. It feels the way I want it to. It's attracting people that I want to be around. It is so fun to like have a physical space that represents like your heart's desire. That sounds very dramatic, but whatever. 
The least favorite thing about running a bookstore is running a bookstore. <laughs> Um, I have to do taxes, I have to be in QuickBooks, I'm ordering all the back stock, I'm unpacking the books, I'm doing all of the mailing, I'm managing the social media, I'm, like I am doing everything and it's exhausting and I have another job and a life and um, the admin side of it can really get to you. And then also like not equating my self-worth or like how I'm doing as a business with sales figures is also really hard. Like seeing a good day and measuring success in a way that isn't tied to how much money or books we sell in the store has been a learning curve. And then I also would say like just dealing with weirdo customers who are like, how's this going? You making any money? Oh, I didn't know bookstores were, you know what I mean? Just like, I'm like, go away. <laughs> Why are you in the bookstore if you're going to hate from, from moment one? And everyone's always asking questions about where's Kiki? Why is Kiki not here more often? We miss him. No one is asking that. No we one knows that guy. We miss him so much. No one knows that guy. He's such a good tattooer. Um, and then last question, with regards to your bookstore, what were some things that surprised you or that you least expected? I think I've said this before, but we sell a ton of new books. I was really hesitant to have a lot of our inventory be new books because of Yuma's soci socio-demographic like breakdown and new books are expensive and all of the feedback I had gotten on the book truck before we had our brick and mortar were that they loved that our prices were affordable and people could shop like good used books at a discounted price but that like hasn't been the case at all for um the brick and mortar people have no problem buying new books which we love all right those are some questions i answered i hope that was fun um third part of this video now are you ready house updates i'm so excited about this so our entire house is gutted we had our floors done Concrete floors are done throughout the entirety of the house. Gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous girls. I love them. Um, we had a guy do them. We did not do them ourselves. They look great. Our kitchen is like almost in. It's almost completely in. The cabinets went in. The shelves went in. Um, the sink is in. We just have to wait for the drywall and the painting to be done. We are retexturing the entire house, which is a huge waste of money. Thank you for asking. But um, I want smooth walls. So that is what we're doing while the whole house is destroyed. <laughs> um, Kiki also did like a ceiling treatment on the ceiling of the kitchen, which is very cool. He did that, that's done. All of the electric has been moved. All of the plumbing has been moved. And after drywall is done, we are going to have our cabinet guy back out again to put in our stove, our dishwasher, and our fridge. And then that'll be like a usable space. I mean, we'll just need to get tiled and some finishing touches. Um, but we're excited for that to happen. And it's going to happen within the next like three to four weeks, which is very cool. After that, the plan is for the bathroom to get on the way. That is a huge tile job that we need to do. And also a lot of green board installation, a lot of drywall installation, and that'll happen as well. That is like less pressing to me because once the kitchen is done and like the walls are done, we can move back into our big house and we can still like shower in this house. So that can take its time. I'm not stressing about that, but I am very excited for the kitchen to be done. So we have like access to our main house again. It'll be just the whole house, just the whole house is being done right now. Um, and then lastly, the bookstore. How's the bookstore doing? The bookstore is going great, you guys. Like I said earlier in that question, I feel like I'm in a good equilibrium with it now. We paid off all of our debt. Huge, huge. We only opened in August, so it's been seven, seven or eight months since we opened and we paid off our initial investment, which I'm so proud of and I'm so grateful for. It was much lower than an average initial bookstore investment has been from like what I've seen online like some people spend you know like a hundred grand on inventory alone we did not do that <laughs> but I put everything on a credit card I didn't have like a small business loan or anything and like the weight off my shoulders of not having like 15 grand of active credit card debt is huge and has also given me 
a sense of like how much the bookstore is pulling in each month and how much I need to save for new inventory, paying myself, and saving for federal taxes and boring stuff like that. So I am loving that and loving having that figured out. And then also it just feels like we're in a good groove. I don't know, my dad has been here more, so he's been there like all the all day on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So I don't even have to like think about the bookstore on Wednesdays and Thursdays and can focus on my real job, which is great. Then I get to be there Friday, Saturday and see all of the, the weekend people, which is my favorite time to be there. So it's going good. Um, update, I painted a scrappy mural. <laughs> I'm gonna put a picture in here now. It's a sun. I think it looks really good. Merch wise, I don't know. I don't really have any future merch visions. We launched our bookworm shirt maybe a couple months ago and that's still selling well. I need to start thinking of what our next big shirt is gonna be for Sunny's t-shirt factory. But merch is chugging along. You should put a laugh track in there. This man. <laughs> my number one hater. <laughs> Sunny's is going well. I'm tired, but Sunny's is going well. We're excited. It's great. Okay, well, I love you guys. Thanks for being here if you are still here. Thanks for partying. Good night and good luck. <laughs>